Welcome to Renewable Energies, live from Jena, a little bit earlier than usually. I mentioned to you why this is so. Um, I see that some five or so students are, are online, nevertheless. Hello to everybody. We want to talk about um, ideal windmills today. We started last time already with some introductory subchapter. Namely, we derived a formula for the kinetic energy that's contained in the wind. And if I speak of kinetic energy, most people would guess or say immediately one half mv squared so that it scales with the velocity squared. But this is actually not true because the higher the wind speed, the larger the mass. And therefore, the, um, the power that's contained in the wind, as opposed to the energy, um, the power contained in the wind scales with the, velocity, uh, with the velocity cube. And we wrote that down last time. So uh, you see uh, my lecture notes from last time. Uh, by the way, the, um, in contrast to yesterday, the chat should work again and give some acoustic feedback. So if the one or the other wants to try it out, please go ahead. Um, so this was, so I say this just because I frequently forget to switch uh, back to the, to the iPad. Okay, anyway, so this was the derivation that we made. And today we'll talk about which fraction of what we wrote down here in this formula. So probably this should be here equation three, I would guess. Maybe I look it up just to have it consistent. Yes, yeah. And once again, uh, the important thing is that this goes as the cube. Um, and today, uh, this is the sentence that I started. Today we want to know which fraction of the power that's contained in the wind is actually available or actually can be converted to um, say electrical en uh, energy. And um, that's um, the next subchapter. So 6.2, the power available um, from wind. 6.2, the power available from wind. And this theory is actually attributed to Albert Betz. And I'm going to introduce him with a few slides in the following. So here you see Albert Betz. He was the successor of Ludwig Brandl. Remember last time we derived the logarithmic wind profile, or was it the lecture before? I don't remember. And uh, this was due to Ludwig Brandl, who was uh, kind of the, um, well, um, um, of, the, uh, of the Nestor of, uh, um, of hydrodynamics in, in Germany in the pioneering uh, days also of um, aviation. And Albert Betz was his uh, successor, um, also a very important um, uh, person in the history of hydrodynamics. He uh, was probably not the first to, um, to, to look at the, uh, at the theory of, um, of windmills, um, but he was certainly the first to write it up in a, in a, in a very nice way. And uh, here I have a reprint of, uh, of his book that he published in 1925 or so. Um, yeah, so you see the first page. So this page uh, you see is a copy on my, on my slide. Um, so it was uh, actually uh, 1926, uh, it's written here. And it's quite uh, interesting what he writes um, as, a preface, uh, as a preface. So um, I'll say it in German, uh, in German. 
because uh, the language is kind of also interesting, I, I, I think. So, um, and you see, uh, these are old letters, um, fracture letters. So, and uh, it reads, so the first few sentences, uh, als nach dem Kriege unsere Wirtschaft in schwerster Weise unter der allgemeinen Kohlennot litt, lenkte sich die Aufmerksamkeit wieder stark anderen Energiequellen zu. Neben dem energischen Ausbau der Wasserkräfte wurde hauptsächlich auch eine stärkere Heranziehung der Windenergie empfohlen. So wandten sich viele Berufene und Unberufene dem Problem, äh, Problem der Windkraftausnützung zu und auch jetzt noch, nachdem die Kohlennot längst überwunden und eher ins Gegenteil umgeschlagen ist, wirkt das einmal geweckte Interesse noch weiter. Um, so what he says is, um, the time was after the First World War and there was a severe lack of, um, of coal in Germany. Yeah, so if you know a little bit about Germany, you know why. Um, and, um, and therefore people, besides hydropower, uh, got interested in, in wind power. And he says that many people started to do that um, professionals and non-professionals, and this book is intended, this he says uh, in, on a later page, is intended uh, to, um, well, to avoid financial losses by, by doing stupid things. Yeah? Um, and one of the things uh, that's in this book, but it's only a small fraction actually, um, is actually devoted to what we are doing today and um, in the next lecture in particular. So let's start. So um, the, the interesting point in the derivation that we are going to make is that, as I said, we find an upper, an, an upper limit of the, um, um, of the power, um, of the fraction of power that we can extract from wind. Um, and we do this by assuming very, a very abstract model, a very general model of windmills. And you may suspect then uh, that this limits the use of, uh, of this limit that we, that we are going to write, derive. No, quite on the contrary, you can actually compare it to Carnot's derivation of the maximum efficiency of a heat engine which is simply based on the fact that you need to get rid of the heat again. Um, and, well, it's actually, there's actually a, a kind of analogy here because what we uh, are going to derive depends heavily on the fact or essentially on the fact that you just say that the wind that goes into the windmill must also go out, yeah? So the air that streams into the plane of the rotor must leave it again. And um, well, with this, we'll make some, um, um, some um, very important uh, conclusions. And actually, I think this is the beauty of physics, that you start with a few very basic assumptions and reach some, um, well, um, uh, some profound insights. Okay, so um, let's uh, write a few remarks in this direction. So the... So we will derive the so-called Betz limit Betz limit, which is the maximum share of the power contained in wind
that can be extracted. Yeah? And uh, the argument um, that we will make Um, assumes a very abstract windmill. Uh, it doesn't assume any kind of technical realization of that windmill. So it just says wind that goes in also has to go out. Wind mill, I wanted to write obviously. Um, windmill, a very abstract windmill. Um, the basic assumption is, and obviously valid assumption is, the basic assumption is that air that goes into the windmill Uh, into the machine must also be allowed to leave it yep. and I mentioned that there is that you can think of an analogy to um, to the canoe um, theory of, of heat engines. So what we'll assume is the following. Let me just um, draw up uh, a small sketch here. So what we assume is the following. So like this. So here we have the windmill. Yeah? And you see, um, I indicated the rotor blades. Um, and, um, well, you also see here the streamlines. We assume a continuous flow of air, right? And uh, so you see the streamlines that touch the tips of the, of the windmill. And if we continue them to pass the windmill, they are shaped approximately like this, and here they are shaped like this. Yeah? Um, so why is this area, so what you could assume of course now is uh, you can also draw many other wind uh, streamlines like this perhaps, right? Uh, one that would be go straight through and so on and so forth. Yeah? Um, so why is it that this area here is smaller than this area and this area is smaller than that area. Well, uh, the reason is that um, the wind speed here is larger than here than here. After all, this is the idea that we want to extract kinetic energy from the wind, which means that the wind speed should be reduced. So it's clear that uh, this velocity should be smaller than this velocity. And the difference um, kind of uh, gives us the, um, the power that we, that we extract. Yeah? So uh, let us write that up, these assumptions that are kind of included into, um, in this sketch already. So we assume homogeneous, we assume a homogeneous stationary flow. Of air, um, with a velocity V1, far in front of the rotor plane, far in front of the rotor plane. 
Um, and V3 far behind. Yep. And in the plane, the wind speed is assumed to be V2. Yep. In the plane, um, the wind speed is V2. I will use these indices all the time throughout this chapter and perhaps also the next chapter. So, when I speak of V2, then I automatically, so when something has the index 2, uh, index, when something has the index 2, then I automatically mean that I am in the plane of the rotor. V1 far in front, V3 far behind. Yeah? So, then there is one other assumption that we have to make. It's um, well, it's an assumption that totally makes sense. Namely, the assumption is that the overall pressure, that the global pressure is the same. So, in particular, what it means is that the pressure far in front of the windmill and far behind is the same. Well, this is what you would assume. Otherwise, there, there, would, be, there would be wind across the windmill, right? And uh, you would lose efficiency with that. Um, don't mistake me. Um, so, very close to the rotor blades, there can actually be pressure differences, significant pressure differences. But um, overall, so uh, globally, the pressure will be constant. So, um, we write down this here. Um, we also assume that the static pressure so you know the difference between static and dynamic pressure yeah, so for dynamic pressure we have to take into account the wind speed uh, what I mean here is the pressure that you would measure with a regular manometer, pressure gauge. Um, I will come to dynamic pressure a little bit later. So, we also assume um, that the static pressure is constant. Yeah, the static pressure, that's the pressure that you also um, that is also cited in the weather report, for example. Um, this implies um, that the air is treated as an incompressible medium, just like a fluid. fluid. Yeah? That um, air is treated as an incompressible medium. Yeah. And I said uh, already, um, just as a remark, locally, um, in particular close to the rotor plates, Um, um, there may be um, large pressure gradients. Yeah. So, on large scale, uh, however, uh, this assumption makes complete sense. Yeah, because the air can, of course, always spread out um, behind the windmill. There is enough room, in particular, uh, in direction, uh, in vertical direction. So, um, and well, this actually um, leads to the following equation. 
namely that if we take the air density, so you know uh, 1.3 kilograms per cubic meter or so, um, multiply it with the velocity and uh, with the area A1, this is the mass stream through this area A1. So the mass per time that goes through uh, the area. Right? So we have uh, just check the dimensions. Yeah? Meters per second and uh, times square meter gives cubic meter per second times rho. Uh, this is the uh, number of kilograms per second. And the same holds, of course, um, for the other areas. And once again, we have assumed that the medium is incompressible, therefore we use the same row, the same density for all three terms here. Good. Now, um, once we have defined these two velocities, we can start to um, say how much power we extracted. This is quite obvious because um, it's, it can only be the difference in the wind power before and after the windmill. Yeah? So more is not possible. So the power extracted from wind, from the wind, is obviously yeah, at maximum, there may be other losses, is obviously the difference of the power of wind far before and behind the rotor, the rotor plane and behind um, the rotor plane. And if we write this in mathematical terms, then what we have is P equals, yeah, so this is the power that we extracted from wind at maximum. So this is delta m over delta t and then the velocity, um, these velocities squared. Right? So I still have delta m over delta t, um, therefore velocity squared and not velocity cube. So now let's discuss two limiting cases. The first one would be um, that we, we that we tr really try hard, yeah. So that we that we are really greedy. So we make v three as small as possible. Yeah. So uh, we make v three equal to zero. The velocity behind the windmill equal to zero. Well, what this means is actually that we stop the wind and therefore there will be no wind carried through the windmill. So then this delta m will be equal to zero. Yeah, so being too greedy doesn't pay. The power will be zero. And the other limiting case would be that we say um, that we say um, we don't stop it at all. Yeah, so the wind speed behind the windmill um, is the same as before the windmill, both are equal, V1 is equal to V3, and then of course the power is also equal to zero. Right? So you see that we have uh, this function P as a function of, well, this difference um, of wind speed, or say as a function of V3, and we see that it has two zero transitions, so probably in between there's a maximum and the goal is to find this maximum. Okay, let's write down this. Um, 
some discussion of limiting cases of limiting cases so the first one would be the wind is slowed down to zero and this means of course that V3 is equal to zero but then as I said, then delta m over delta t is also equal to zero, and this means that p is equal to zero, right? And the other case would be um, the wind is not slowed down at all. which is equivalent that V3 is equal to V1. And then, of course, uh, the power is also equal to zero. And as a conclusion, there should be a maximum um, there should be a maximum for, yeah, so for V3 element of V1 and 0. Yep, and we want to find it. OK, well, now it would be very nice if we would know this velocity V2, so the velocity in the plane of the windmill. Because if we know this velocity, then we can immediately say how much mass per time goes through the windmill. Yeah? And well, what we'll do is that we just assume uh, that we know this velocity, and then we actually just make a guess uh, of this velocity. And only in a later subchapter it will turn out that this case is actually is actually right. Okay, so um, if we would know if we would know v two, yeah, um, we would also know we could calculate the rate of mass that goes through the windmill. And uh, that's easy. Yeah, so uh, we derived this actually in the last lecture. Yeah, so if you look here, um, then you see exactly this. Yeah, so if this is V2, uh, this area uh, through which it streams, through which the, which the air streams, then this is actually the formula that we are going to use. Yeah, so m dot is equal, according to equation two, to rho times a2 times v2. And um, we just write rho times a. With a, we always mean the area swept by the, by the windmill. Yeah? So by definition, this is rho times a times v2. Yeah? And now we make a guess on how large v2 is. And we say it's just the arithmetic mean between v1 and v2. Yeah? So we make a guess, and it, as I said already, it will turn out to be true. So we are going to prove this guess uh, later in the, um, yeah, in the, not in the next chapter, but the chap chapter after, after next chapter. So we make a guess for V2 
namely v2 is equal to v1 plus v3 divided by 2. Yeah, so, this is equation 7 and the one before was equation 6. So, now we substitute these two equations, equation 6 and 7, we substitute into our equation where we calculated um, the, the wind power. Yeah, so, we substitute um, these two equations in equation 5. Let's do that. So, um, 6 and 7 in 5. Yeah? So, then we have that the power is given by 1 half rho times A times V2 times, yeah, so I did not do anything so far, but now I am going to substitute this. Yeah? So, what I first do is that I will substitute this here into here. So, this means that we now have um, one half rho times A as before and then instead of V2, I write V1 plus V3 divided by 2. Um, then a, a little bit of space yeah, for a later addition and um, for this expression actually, so for this expression, I use one of the binomial formulas in Germany, we call this, yeah, in German schools, we call it the third uh, binomial formula. So, I write V1 plus V3, again a little bit of space and then V1 minus V3. And what I do in addition is that I expand the ex entire expression with V1. So, I write here V1 divided by V1, also here V1 divided by V1 and also here. Yeah? So, I will collect all these V1s here, all these V1s in the, uh, denom uh, in the uh, numerator. Yeah? So, I collect them and write them as V1 cube. Um, before um, all brackets here. So, then I have here one half rho A V 1 cube and um, I have all the rest, right. So, I have one half um, from this, yeah, so one half from this here. Um, and then I divide through, through V1. Yeah, so, if I divide V1, yeah, so then I get here 1 and here V3 over, um, over V1. So, I have V1 times um, 1 plus V3 divided by V1, 1 plus V3 divided by V1 and then 1 minus V3 divided by V1. Yeah. And well, if you paid attention, then you probably realized that this here is of course an interesting expression that we know already from last lecture. This is actually the power contained in the wind. So, this is this equation. Yeah, so, this, so what we see is that we that the power extracted from the wind, yeah, this power is equal to the power that's contained in the wind, the total power that's contained in the wind multiplied with some factor and um, well, this is apparently the fraction that, um, yeah, um, that we that we can gain, yeah, so that we can extract. So um, let's write that down. Yeah, so this here is the wind power. Uh, perhaps I should give this here um, an index here extracted. 
yeah, something like that. And uh, this here is called the power coefficient, or in German it would be Leistungsbeiwert, the power coefficient. And it gets the simple CP power coefficient. Well, um, obviously, this P extracted will be maximum where this power coefficient will be maximum. So, the, it's clear what we have to do. We have to find the maximum of this uh, expression in square brackets. So, 8. Um, P extracted will assume its maximum Um, where CP is maximum. Yeah. And now you see that, um, that the variable here is always, so all these here are, are the same, right? And instead of yeah, finding the maximum with respect to um, the ratio of V3 over V1, uh, I write x, yeah? so I write um, Cp is one half, one plus x, one minus x squared, right? And then we can find um, the maximum, right? And in order to do that, we just take the derivative and find the zero. And when we take the derivative, then we find minus 3x squared minus 2x plus 1 should be equal to 0. And from this, we find um, that x is 1 third. Yeah? So x is 1 third. This means when the velocity far after the windmill is just when the wind speed far after the windmill is just one third of the wind speed far in front of the windmill, then we find the maximum. Yeah? Okay. Well, um, and now we can calculate actually how big uh, CP is. Right? So what we get for the maximum. Um, is, and this is called uh, the Betz coefficient. Yeah? So what we get is 1 over 2, 1 plus 1 third, 1 minus 1 third squared, so uh, 1 minus 1 ninth, and this is 16 over 27, or roughly 59%. Yeah? So 59% of the 59% um, of the power contained in the wind can actually be, be used, can be extracted. Very nice, um, uh, very nice formula, isn't it? Yeah? And uh, fundamental to, to the wind industry, the bits limit. Yeah, um, just to show um, a graph showing this. Yeah, here it is. Yeah, so here you see the functional dependence um, of that. Okay, I mentioned already that in this case, the wind speed is reduced to one third. But we also said that the wind speed in the plane of the rotor is the um, average between the mean between V3 and V1. So this would be two thirds. Yeah? Um, yeah, 
Yeah, so the maximum CP is obtained when V3 is equal to uh, one third of V1 and V2 is equal to two thirds of V1. Good, very important result. So I hope you like it. Yeah, so um, I like such physics, I have to say. Well, um, what else do I have to show here uh, for this subchapter? Let me see. Okay. Well, let's come to the next uh, chapter. And what we will um, look at is, uh, is also some, something uh, a little bit funny, right? We want to look at the, at the force with which the wind pushes against uh, a windmill that runs at the maximum efficiency. Yeah? So if you look at uh, um, these windmills here outside, um, then they have these, um, these thin um, blades which cover, you know, the area of which covers only um, a small fraction of the area that they swipe. Right? And you might guess that the force that the wind, the drag, Luftwiderstand, um, that um, is exerted on, on the windmill must be quite, quite small. We'll see what comes out. So we uh, want to look at the thrust, the shoop, um, that acts on the windmill. So on the force that tries to overthrow the windmill. Sometimes this happens. I have a few pictures on that. Um, Okay, next sub, uh, next sub chapter, 6.3, the thrust acting on the windmill. Yeah, how to approach this problem? We um, take a very um, canonic way. Namely, we just say that the force is equal to the change in momentum. Yeah? So the force is the temporal derivative of the momentum of the wind. This is how we start. The force is the temporal derivative of the momentum of wind. And we write down a formula immediately, namely that the force is equal to, well, the change in the mass V1 minus V3, right? And now we substitute these equations that we already substitute up here, namely 5 and 6. No, actually 6 and 7, so these two um, equations. Um, by the way, this didn't get a, a house number. Well, also should get a house number, this, this result here. Something like this. Okay, so we substitute equations six and seven into this um, uh, into this um, expression. Six and seven, and then we get rho times a times v one plus v three divided by two. Yeah, so remember, this is the wind speed in the rotor plane. And uh, here we have V1 minus V3, right? Okay, 
Well, we can, we can do that. So what we get now is, um, yeah, so what I would do is that, uh, that we substitute here v3 is equal to one third v1, right? And then, uh, of course, also here, right, for uh, also here. And if we do that, uh, then we can immediately find an expression for that. So we have rho times a times one half, and then four over three v1, two over three v1. And what this is, is f is equal to, well, the thrust coefficient, Schub, coef uh, Schub coefficient, therefore, yeah, because it's German, kind of, uh, I use the German abbreviation, the, um, an S as an index. So we have one half times rho times V1 squared times A. Yeah? Um, where this thrust coefficient is equal to 8 over 9. Okay, in order to explain what this means, I have to make an excursion to, um, to track. So um, everybody, yeah, I guess everybody knows uh, track from uh, perhaps an early interest in cars. Right? And if you look at um, a data sheet of cars, then um, you find, of course, uh, many numbers. But uh, what you usually also find is the, the track coefficient. In Germany, it's also called the CV-Wert. Yeah, it's a C as coefficient and W as Widerstand, Luftwiderstand. So in English, track coefficient. Uh, in English literature, it's probably called CD. Yeah, but in German, it's the CW value. And what you find here is a nice uh, graph that I found somewhere on the internet. So here's the reference. Um, namely, the historic development of the CW value for different makes of cars, for different models of cars. And also for some, ex um, for some experimental models here. Right? And what you see is that uh, they really started close to one. And then it went down, went down, and uh, well, yeah. Um, uh, this car here doesn't look very practical, I would say. Uh, this here is ugly. Um, so, and it has a CW value of a little bit less than, than 0 0.2, perhaps uh, 0 0.15, right? This value is, of course, important for a car because if you want to calculate the force, so the air resistance, so the force that the air exerts on the car, then you find the following formula that's uh, actually shown here. Yeah, so it depends on the wind, uh, on, um, yeah, on the car speed, so on the relative speed between car and, and air uh, with the square of the velocity. So what you find here is the cross-section of the car. And um, well, this is the density of the air and this is this coefficient that depends on the geometry of the car. Well, and, uh, it's actually, so intuitively, it's actually not possible to predict, um, to predict uh, which shape of a car um, has which um, CW value. So if you look at these two cars, and I would ask you to, to guess uh, the CW value, right? Uh, then at least I would guess that uh, this car has a higher CW value than this. Well, actually they have the same CW value um, of 0 0.2. Yeah, so somewhere, somewhere just here at this line. Well, and if we speak about um, saving fuel uh, in cars, um, then of course a, C, a low CW value is important. 
But what you also see is, well, I have to go back to, to my slide. Uh, what you also see is that the cross-section of the car is important. So in our German discussion on a speed limit on the Autobahn, yeah, so um, people um, call for a smaller velocity, and this seems to make perfect sense because it even goes like the square. But what we really talk about is the cross-section of a car. Yeah, so a SUV with at least twice the cross-section of a, of a regular car and probably also a higher CW value. Um, so I would, um, I would actually uh, introduce a speed limit that's proportional to the, um, well, not quite. So I would uh, uh, introduce a limit uh, pro uh, proportional to the product of V squared and A. Right, so uh, the smaller cars, they are allowed to, to go faster. Um, I would, yeah, so this would be, this would be a friendly, uh, friendly measure in, in my opinion. Uh, well, a large car obviously also um, takes resources other than just uh, consuming fuel. Okay, anyway, um, ah, I'm not done with my slides, I, I just realize. Oh, well, let's go on. Um, so, uh, what we see actually is the following. What we see is that, um, yeah, so um, just to, for comparison, I write down the, force, um, the expression for drag. So this is CW, then one half rho times A times V squared. So this is what I had on my slides. So and you see this is exactly the, sh the same shape. So what we see is that this thrust coefficient, that this thrust coefficient is the equivalent of that. Well, and what we see is that it's close to one. Right? Quite remarkable. Just a slide on that. Yeah, so um, this is a windmill. And now um, a few test bodies, test shapes um, for, the, um, for, for, uh, for air drag. Yeah, so, so the CW value here for, well, for a, for a sphere, it's approximately 0 0.5. Half a sphere, it's a little bit better, right? 0 0.4, so this drop-like shape, 0 0.1, but to the other extreme, right? If I just take a plate, then it's approximately one, and this crazy thing would be two. So what this, what this means is that the CW value, so to say, of a windmill, is approximately this one here, right? So when a windmill runs at its full power, and only for this condition we derive that, when the windmill uh, delivers the, the bets limit, then uh, the, the, uh, the, the air track, so the thrust um, on the windmill is uh, equal to almost a solid plate, right? So hard to believe. I remember when I gave this course for the first time, um, it was actually in this room, and I know where the student uh, was sitting, who said, no, <laughs> I don't believe that. Uh, this can't be true, so I, I made the calculation, but the student insisted, no, this, uh, this is not true. Well, it is very true, actually. And, uh, and it's a problem, um, and the, or it can be a problem. Uh, and uh, the problem is the following. So this one here. So from time to time, we hear a few years ago, there were, a, yeah, so there was actually a series of, of such accidents, namely that the wind, that a storm overthrow um, a windmill. What had happened? Well, when the wind gets too strong, 
then what a windmill does is actually that it changes the pitch of the rotor plates and um, therefore um, the windmill doesn't deliver the maximum, uh, the, the bet's maximum, but something smaller, right? And uh, well, if the windmill is, isn't running at all, then the entire thrust is actually just according to uh, the relatively small area of the plates themselves, right? So when the wind gets stronger, such that it exceeds the capacity of the windmill, then one has to change the pitch such that, um, well, that the power, um, so that the extracted power from the wind and in connection with that also the thrust gets smaller. And if this doesn't work, if this regulation, so if this uh, servo loop doesn't work properly, right, or too slow, then um, this is what happens, right? Another funny picture of this kind. Uh, I found it on a website of nuclear power enthusiasts. Yeah, so obviously the idea was that, uh, that windmills are dangerous. Of course they can be dangerous. Yeah, whether I would compare it to nuclear, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, so we say those who sit in the glass house shouldn't throw stones. Okay, so let's write um, these remarks. Uh, yeah, maybe I delayed it for a short while. So this is equation 11. Um, 11 looks or has the same structure as the formula um, for drag Luftwiderstand. Yeah, air resistance. Namely, and now I write it down again, FCW is equal to one half rho times uh, V1 squared A, right? So now we compare CS to a solid disk, yeah? a solid disk has a CW value of 1.1. This is what I found in the literature. This means the thrust load on a windmill Running at maximum efficiency, this is important, this um, part of the sentence. Running at maximum efficiency is close to the air track of a solid disk of the same diameter. Good. So what next? Ah yeah, so there's one thing that we didn't do. Namely, we said that V2 is equal to V1 plus V3 divided by 2, yeah, so that the wind speed in the plane of the windmill is equal to the arithmetic mean of the wind speeds far in front and far behind the windmill. And this we want to 
we want to prove. And uh, the chapter, so the two gentlemen to which this is attributed, these are Fruit and Rankine. So let me introduce the two gentlemen here. Here they are. Yeah, so you see William Rankine. He was one of the pioneers of thermodynamics and he actually made the theory for for pretty much all heat engines, so including um, steam engines, way of condensation and stuff, and, and so on and so forth. So he was actually uh, he was actually a polymath. Um, he did numbers, everything from number theory to I think even biology, biology. and he was also. Um, 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 yeah, had uh, artistic gifts, so uh, played cello, did, did music, um, wrote humorous poems, and so on and so forth. So quite an interesting person. Um, and then you see William Froude, um, and uh, he was a, a pioneer of the of the hulls of ships, yeah, so of the shape of the ship uh, body. Um, and um, yeah, two famous um, uh, famous models. So what he actually did was that he um, derived the scaling laws um, for um, for these um, yeah, ship shapes, for these hull shapes. So the idea, um, you know, uh, a ship is very expensive, if, in particular if it is a large ship. And of course, uh, you want to know in advance how well it perf performs on the ocean. Yeah, so, and we are uh, talking about some British gentlemen, British Empire in the 19th century. Right? So this was, this was really important, to be able to make a small model and scale it up. And for this, uh, to this end, uh, Fruit introduced what's now called the fruit number. And there you can, um, well, there you can uh, find um, the relevant combination of the size of the ship, um, uh, the speed of the ship, and so on and so forth, right? And he tested that out and it was uh, validated, um, which made him very famous um, and very important for the British Admiralty. Uh, so they even built him uh, such a, a tank, yeah, so such a pool uh, in his private backyard so that he could do his research at his home. And um, so these are two, um, two ships that, which are kind of important because um, there was another British gentleman at, around that time, namely Scott Russell. The, uh, he is the discoverer of the solitons. Now in my nonlinear optics lecture, um, he will um, he has a prominent place. Um, and he had a theory um, on well um, resistance of in water and so on, right? And according to that theory, um, they uh, designed the ship. The yeah, it's called Raven. And the other one I forgot, right? It turned out uh, that Scott Russell's theory was not quite right, uh, at least not at, it was not independent of the, of the velocities. So you see, um, important person. Ah, okay, good. So these are these two gentlemen, and um, now we want to derive um, what, what they, um, derived 100 years, more than 100 years ago. So like this. This is 6.4. I hope my numbering is correct. 6.2, so 6.4, good. the fruit Rankine theorem. So
So actually, what's the time? Yeah, this should be sufficient. Um, this should be sufficient. I think I can do it in 20 minutes or so, perhaps even less. So our goal is, our goal is to verify equation, what was it? Equation seven. Yeah. Um, we start um, we start with the thrust of the rotor again. Yeah. So we start. We just write down the this formula, and then we try to find another one. Um, and um, well, we kind of compare both, and uh, then we find a condition. So we um, found. the thrust on the rotor yeah, from uh, the momentum theorem, namely that f is equal to m dot and the difference of the velocities. Yeah? Um, and now we try to find another equation for the thrust. And um, for this a small sketch, here, this one here. Yeah, so we'll look a little bit more detailed into things now. Yeah, so you still see, uh, you still see the, um, um, yeah, so, well, what you see is that we have a pressure here, P1, and here, P3. We already know that they should be equal. But you see also the streamlines here, right? So the rotor. And now I've indicated that just before, just, uh, well, epsilon in front of the rotor and epsilon behind the rotor, there can be um, pressure difference. And actually, this pressure difference uh, is said to be dangerous to, um, uh, to bats yeah, to, or even to birds because it is said that they would could even destroy their lungs or something like that. I'm not sure whether this is true. Uh, probably um, those, uh, the bats that die uh, at a windmill, they are probably directly hit. Um, okay, and now we try to find expressions for, well, for these pressures. And what we are going to use is the Bernoulli equation, which is kind of, energy conservation for continuous media. So what we want to do is find another ex expression for the thrust. Um, the thrust can also be derived using the Bernoulli equation. And actually, we are going to use it twice. Yeah? The Bernoulli equation. So what we say is, yeah, the Bernoulli equation says that P1 plus rho, times, uh, rho divided by 2 times V1 squared. Yeah? So it looks like energy conservation, potential energy plus kinetic energy. Um, that this is equal throughout um, a streamline in particular. Yeah? So um, then we would have P2 minus epsilon, so just in front of the rotor plate, plus rho divided by 2, V2 squared. Um, so V2 minus epsilon, I write. Uh, of course, we know that the wind speed, that this must be continuous, but uh, yeah, just without thinking, I would, I would write it like this. Um, and we can do the same thing for P3. Yeah, so we have P3 plus rho over 2 
V3 squared, and then we have P2 plus epsilon plus rho over 2 V2 plus epsilon squared. Yeah? That's equation 15. Uh, or equations 15, ah no, uh, I should actually say 15a and 15b, because what I m want to do is to subtract uh, these two equations from each other. So 15a and 15b. So, um, this is the next point, 15b is subtracted from 15a yeah. and what we also use is that there can't be any discontinuity for the velocity, of course not. Right? So, uh, otherwise there would, be, there would be no streamline. For example, um, um, yeah. So, and we use that v two minus epsilon is equal v two plus epsilon for reasons of continuity. And what we also use is what I already mentioned, namely that P1 and P3 are equal. Yeah? P1 is equal to P3 as already discussed. In section 6.2. Yeah? And if we do so, then we find that rho over 2 v1 squared minus v3 squared is equal to this pressure difference. So b2 minus epsilon minus b2 plus epsilon. That's equation 16. Yeah, so quite straightforward. Just use uh, the um, just used um, Bernoulli's equation. So what we now found is actually also interesting. Yeah, we know, of course, the um, we know, of course, the velocities, in particular, the velocity difference. We know that v three is one third of v one for maximum for operation at maximum efficiency. So therefore, we know that there must be this pressure difference. Actually. I should calculate this uh, at some point. Yeah? Uh, of course, we uh, assume here an infinitely thin um, uh, plate, but nevertheless, uh, it would be interesting to find how big this is. Well, it's probably pretty easy uh, to estimate um, yeah? because it has, of course, to do with the, um, with the thrust on the windmill. Yeah? So force divided by the area. So, uh, and here's a sketch um, on how this looks like. So, this pressure difference. Yeah, so, you see in, in blue, you see the velocity yeah, that drops to, to one third. Right. We want to find that it's indeed two thirds here in the middle. Yeah, so this is just, uh, I didn't calculate that. Yeah? So this is just more or less drawn by hand. And what you find for the pressure is that it goes like this. Yeah? So this uh, you can guess here from, um, you can guess from this equation here. So, 
um, using delta P is equal to F divided by the area, this can be used um, to compute the force or the thrust. Yeah, so we would have F is equal to A times this pressure difference and this according to 16 is rho over 2 times A times V1 squared minus V3 squared. Yeah. Now we compare this to what we had um, above. Yeah. On the other hand, on the other hand, um, we had equation 11, namely F equals um, rho times A times V2, V1 minus V3. Uh, so that's equation 18. That's equation 17 here. And then, of course, um, we compare, compare both. And we are done. So, um, compare 17 and 18. So, we have rho divided by 2 times A times V1 minus V3, V1 plus V3. Uh, that's equation 17. Is equal to equation 18, namely rho times A times V2 times V1 minus V3. Well, and now a few things can be um, cancelled here. Yeah, something like this, and uh, most importantly, this one here. Yeah? And uh, now you see that we have exactly what we um, what we promised, namely that V2 is equal to V1 plus V3 divided by 2. Good. Yeah, we could, we could go for, we could do a little bit more. Yeah, so let me introduce a few things that we are going to use heavily next time. And for this, I show a few other view graphs. A few other view graphs. Here we are. So the next thing uh, that we want to talk about is how um, how a windmill is actually um, brought into motion. Yeah. So what what is the force? So what is the nature of the forces that um, propel a windmill? And um, there are two options, actually, for a windmill. And uh, one relies on drag, yeah, on the phenomenon that we just have discussed. And the a very well-known example, or the most well-known, and probably also oldest example, is the Persian windmill. So it's, uh, here you see a model uh, that's in the Deutsche Museum. Right? So you also see the reference. It, uh, it was kind of funny, yeah? so um, one has to cite the author uh, um, of this reference here. And uh, the name of this author, uh, or the name he gave himself, the Wikipedia name, is actually Saupreis. And uh, you know, this is the derogative uh, expression for, for people in Bavaria, for Bavarians, uh, that they use on all people that are north of the Main River or so. Yeah? Um, so I'm 
according to that, I'm certainly was a surprise. Uh, so they mean the Prussians, right? So, and you know, there was a historic uh, conflict between Bavaria and, and Prussia. And uh, well, uh, now it's mostly humorous, but this guy obviously <laughs> had, has a lot of uh, self-irony. Uh, so I, I found this, found this nice. Okay, so he took this photo of, uh, uh, of this model of a Persian windmill, and you know, somewhere in the, uh, in the region between uh, Iran and Afghanistan, um, there's a region where there is a steady wind for 120 days per year. Uh, so it's a local wind phenomenon uh, there. This wind is quite, uh, obviously quite, quite nasty because uh, the city at, um, at which this um, windmill that's apparently still in operation is, is, uh, uh, is located, this is uh, actually, so if you would translate the name of the city, it would be biting wind, yeah, so probably ugly wind. And uh, these windmills, they are not the optimum because they rely on drag. Yeah, so you, here you see uh, a cross section through this windmill. Yeah, so, and uh, it's drag that propels this windmill. And you see that it only kind of uses half of the cross section more or less. Well, perhaps a little bit more because this is kind of a nozzle and so on and so forth. Right here you see this nozzle even nicer. Yeah, so uh, they optimize these windmills, of course, also. Uh, these are ancient, uh, this is ancient technology going back to, um, uh, to the Middle Ages or so. Yeah, so uh, 500, near 500 or so. Um, yes, so these are, um, these are uh, mill, uh, windmills that rely on track. Uh, modern windmills, and here you see kind of the father of modern, uh, modern windmills. This is Paul Lacour, um, a Danish scientist. Um, he looked into a, a quite diverse uh, range of, of engineering, and at some point he was, uh, he was um, appointed as a, as a teacher at a, at a school, at a higher school. And in order to provide electricity, and he believed in the future of electricity, which, uh, so he was a modern man yeah, for his time, um, and in order to, uh, to provide electricity, he built, um, for example, this windmill next to, to the school where he, uh, where he taught. Um, yeah, and this is one of the early types of windmills, looks completely different as compared to windmills that were built so far. Um, and uh, it relies not on drag, but on lift. Right. So and for lift, um, yeah, so if we dis discuss lift, um, then um, I should probably, I should probably um, write down the respective formula. And interestingly, it looks just, um, just like the formula that we had so far. Yeah, so um, a little bit on air foils, yeah, or um, I make it shorter than you find it in the script. So let's just call it lift. Yeah, lift and, and glide number. We will need the glide number later. So the formula for lift is the following. So lift, Auftrieb in German, German right? If A is equal to CA, and then we have one half rho a times v squared. Yeah. And now um, a is of course, uh, is of course, um, a little bit uh, yeah, defined a little bit different. So if you have an airfoil, and I try to draw one, so perhaps like this, 
right? So this would be a, a profile of such a, right? Uh, then one doesn't use the cross section at, uh, as we usually take it, but one uses, one uses actually um, uh, this area here. Right, so this would be here A. Yeah. Well, and there's this lift coefficient, and this lift coefficient depends, of course, uh, very similar to what we had uh, for for drag. This depends on the geometry of the profile. There are all kinds of profiles uh, that have been developed by people like Brandl and Betz. Yeah, so the, they had this Kaiser Wilhelm Institute uh, just for this, or yeah, to a large extent for this purpose. Uh, now an interesting figure um, on which you can see on which you can see both compared. Yeah, so what we have here. Is, um, is on the one hand the drag coefficient. So, and um, it is drawn here as a function of the angle of attack. So I should also define this before we go on. Um, so we have, uh, we have an airfoil, Tragfläche, like this, say, right? So this would be kind of a symmetry line. And then we have the angle of attack. This is called alpha. Alpha A, actually. Yeah? A like attack. Anströmwinkel. And uh, as you can imagine, for a given velocity, uh, the bigger you make that, right? so the more area you have in the, um, um, yeah, so the, um, the, the higher the track. Yeah, so this curve is trivial, kind of, right? And now the same for, for lift. Yeah, so here's the lift coefficient, and uh, it goes pretty much linearly um, all the way up until a point which is called stall, or in German Strömungsabriss, yeah, where it goes down uh, very quickly. Yeah, so as you make the, um, the angle of attack larger, the lift gets larger, also the air resistance gets larger, right? And probably there, at some point there's a sweet spot, yeah? so where you get a nice lift and fairly low drag, such that you can, um, uh, can, can build an efficient airplane. Yeah? And stall is, of course, a dangerous point, right? So close to the point of stall, so um, all planes, even smaller planes, they have devices that would warn um, the pilot um, of stall, uh, because uh, stall, yeah, so the sudden decrease um, of lift is a very dangerous situation. Yeah? And um, yeah, so what you see here, is uh, an illustration for that. That's actually the so-called the so-called coffin corner Sark Ecke. Yeah, so um, it's called like that. Well, uh, you could call this corner uh, without uh, saying something about a, a coffin. But uh, actually, what you see is that it's a dangerous point. Yeah? So, because um, if you are, if you go, um, uh, if you go slower, um, then um, you have stall, right? And uh, if there's too much speed, yeah? so here's somewhere the Mach limit, um, that's also bad, right? And uh, therefore, for an airplane, so the higher you f fly. Yeah, the smaller this, uh, yeah, so the smaller the range at which you can fly, the smaller the range of the, of the velocity of the airplane that is allowed. 
right? And well, uh, up here, it gets, yeah, so uh, you have to have precisely the right velocity in, in an airplane. Yeah, so an airplane at, at a height of, um, uh, of 10,000 meters uh, has only a margin of uh, a few 10 uh, kilometers per hour within it has to operate. Yeah? So uh, this sounds dangerous, right? So it's, it's important to reali reliably measure the relative wind speed between uh, the airplane and, uh, and the wind uh, and the air, right? And what is used for that are the so-called uh, Pitot detectors, Pitot sonde. Yeah, so it's just a, a tube uh, where you actually convert dynamic pressure into static pressure. Right? So um, there's a little hole and uh, air streams in and is, well, Stausonde yeah, uh, is, is, is stopped and this creates air pressure and this is measured. Um, so these devices are that you find outside uh, the, uh, the airplane, of course, uh, they are important, right? And uh, if they don't work, then things get really dangerous. And one famous tragedy that's related to that is the um, tragedy um, of Air Frost uh, 447. Uh, more than 10 years ago, 2009, if I'm not mistaken, this was a, um, an airplane, so a, a flight from uh, Rio de Janeiro to, to Paris. And um, it turned later out that, the, that there was ice in these, um, in these Pitot probes. Um, and so the pilots, uh, so the chief pilot, uh, was sleeping, um, and the two pilots uh, in the cockpit, uh, they couldn't manage the situation. And so they didn't know it was dark, they didn't know where they are, and uh, so it must have been a horrendous situation. And when the chief captain um, finally came into the cockpit, uh, it was too late. So, um, well, this is actually a bad slide to finish a, a lecture, but I have to finish anyway, so um, sorry for that. And see you next uh, Tuesday on the right time. And what we are going to do is that we will calculate the shape um, of, uh, of the rotor plates uh, uh, of a windmill according to the Betz theory. So we'll use the insight that we gained today in order to, to carry it to a huge step beyond what we did today, namely we want to calculate the geometry of the rotor blades. Sounds interesting, doesn't it? Thank you.